Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Maxine barish Reeden. I'm the co-medical director of the Sutter Valley Institute for Health and Healing Clinics, and I'm here to make a very special announcement. But first, a quick story. In 2012, near the end of my integrative medicine fellowship with Dr. Andrew Weil, I followed my heart and I left my primary care practice in Sacramento with Sutter to start a one-room integrative medicine clinic. Demand for this type of care was extraordinary and our little clinical program began to grow very quickly. So in 2016, we joined forces with the Sutter Health Institute for Health and Healing Clinics in the Bay Area. We essentially became a service line of integrative medicine across Sutter Health and we moved to a larger beautiful space in Sacramento. Our team continued to grow, but we still couldn't keep up with the demand for integrative medicine, as well as the other services that we offered, like acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine, mind, body, spirit medicine, nutrition. And we also saw demand for these services increase in our sister city, Roseville, California. So today I am beyond proud to announce the opening of the Sutter Medical Foundation Institute for Health and Healing Lucchetti Vincent Family Center in Roseville, California. It's so important for us to mark this milestone because it took so many kind and dedicated people and hundreds of hours for us to achieve this event. We open our new clinic on April 4th of this year with a beautiful healing lobby, eight calming and restorative treatment rooms, inspiring artwork throughout, a healing garden, an adjacent space for classes and talks. So we are delighted to launch our new clinic with an amazing and talented team of providers, including Drs. Eric Kassid, Jennifer Griffin, and Babak Kanani, as well as our physician assistant, Marco Fiero. We also have two Chinese medicine specialists and acupuncturists, Mark Velez and Amy O'Donnell. Our wellness nurse coordinator, Kim DeFazio, will be helping us to launch our new wellness program and will also offer heart math and our health and nutrition coach, Lauren Henkel, is with our team as well in Roseville. We'll also continue to offer multiple educational classes and programs that will be available virtually, including nutrition, stress reduction classes, and the lecture series that my colleague, Eric Kassid, will tell you about shortly. In the near future, we'll be adding integrative psychotherapy as well to the clinic in Roseville. The new Roseville IHH Care Center and our many programs would not be possible without support from our generous donors who helped us to raise $2 million to complete the Roseville Clinic. I'd like to thank all of those who have helped us to reach this amazing philanthropic goal, but I'd also like to call out a few people in particular who were instrumental in this effort including the Lucchetti Vincent family, who were our major donors and for whom our clinic is named, Shirley and uh, Joseph Leroy, Bonnie and Tom Marks, Dick and Judy Ozen, James and Stephanie Tilton, Herbert Yee and Inez Yee Foundation, Allison and Mark Sadler, and the Epic Systems Corporation. I also want to thank Sutter Health for their support and our matching grant. They have helped us to make this dream come true. Thank you again for being here today. We are so grateful that you are here to hear about this incredibly important topic with Dr. William Lee. But for now, I'd like to introduce my co-medical director and partner in crime, Dr. <laughs> Eric Kassid, and he will tell you about tonight's fabulous speaker. And then later on, our colleague, Dr. Akhil Palani-Sami will join us for Q&A. Take it away, Eric. Thank you, Max. Welcome, everyone. And thank you all really truly for joining us for tonight's Healing Perspective Lectures with Dr. William Lee. For those that are new to Sutter Institute for Health and Healing, I want to share a little bit more about the unique care we provide here. We at IHH believe that optimal health forms the foundation of disease prevention as well as disease management, and that addressing the following core factors are critical to achieving optimal health. And what are those core factors? Well, they're the four pillars you may have all heard about. We address nutrition and gastrointestinal health, emotional and spiritual health, exercise and movement, and sleep quality. In addition to the more traditional integrated medicine services, we in the Valley provide health coaching and a whole host of wellness services and classes that serve to empower patients to achieve their desired health goals. 
We collectively have integrative medicine clinics located in Sacramento, Roseville, San Francisco, Santa Rosa, and San Carlos. And they all offer a variety of services, including integrative physician care, mind, body, health, acupuncture, and at some locations, wellness programs with health coaching and classes and nutrition, and in other locations, chiropractic care and massage therapy. We offer free healing perspective events like this one multiple times throughout the year with two more events coming this fall. We also host virtual classes to help you move from simple health education to action that can transform your well-being. Um, I'm really excited that I'm able to offer a health, healthy living educational series. Uh, I'm not biased, but it seems to be that uh, actually people seem to be enjoyed and really engage. And it's something I think people can truly benefit from. On June 8th, um, from 12 to 1 p.m., I will be hosting the Sleep and Your Health class, which is one of my six-part wellness series. Many people do, may or may not know, but poor sleep is often underappreciated cause of many chronic illnesses. In, in this class, in an inclusive group setting, you will learn about common sleep disorders and how they can influence health and chronic disease. You will also learn how to optimize your sleep based on the latest research and practical advice. Each class is only $30. To learn more, scan the QR code, click on, click on the link in the chat, or call 916 887 4660. I truly hope you decide to join us. Please note, today's lecture is for informational purposes only. Everyone's situation is very unique, and we ask that you seek out professional advice for your specific medical needs and concerns. Now, a little housekeeping as usual. Before we get started, please know you can, act, you can, access, this, you can access this talk directly from this event on the YouTube link in the chat. Many people learn best by watching and listening to our talks first, then returning to the recordings to take notes. If you are joining us via our YouTube stream today, you will not be able to participate in the chat box, questions, or Q&A. Now on to our wonderful speaker. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. William Lee. He is a world-renowned physician, scientist, speaker, and author of Eat to Beat Disease, the new science of how your body can heal itself. He has appeared on Good Morning America, CNN, MSNBC, NPR, Voice of America. His thought leadership has been featured in The Atlantic, Time, and The New York Times, and published in over 100 top scientific journals. Now it is my sincere honor to welcome Dr. William Lee. Well, good evening. Uh, hello, and thank you, Eric and Max, for the kind invitation and Akil uh, to speak to the Sutter Health community. It's really my pleasure to um, join and contribute to such a community that really cares about integrative health. And what I wanted to bring to the table and, and to share with you is some of the work I've done on food and health. And what I hope to show you in this, uh, this evening's presentation is that some of the things that you may have actually thought of when it comes to food and health may not actually be what the science actually shows. One of the big things that we all um, struggle with when it comes to nutrition is not only to kind of um, uh, uh, figure out what our own individual needs are, but how to actually find trusted voices uh, because there are so many people that talk about uh, food and health and, uh, and you've heard about superfoods and super supplements. And uh, like myself, it's, it's sometimes difficult to kind of uh, uh, pick your way through what seems to be uh, too good to be true versus what the science actually tells you. So what I'm going to tell you is that by the end of this presentation, hopefully you'll be able to walk away with some science that actually is practical uh, so that you can take some action steps. So uh, with that, um, I wrote this book called Eat to Beat Disease. Uh, and um, it actually uh, what I'm going to talk about this evening is actually the research that went into writing this book. This wound up becoming a New York Times bestseller. It's, pub it's translated into 20 different languages. Uh, and for anybody who wants to learn more about the specific foods that I'm going to be talking about, there's many more foods, many more tips, and also recipes uh, that I wrote about. Okay, so we're going to get everyone involved a little bit now. And I think this is the fun part. I'm, I'm going to actually um, ask you a question. And, uh, and then I'm going to ask you to uh, go into your chat uh, and answer. So what I'd like to ask you 
uh, it, it, it's my statement and you're gonna answer true or false. Okay, so the question is this, nitrates in food are bad for you, true or false? Nitrates in food are bad for you, true or false? I see a lot of trues, go ahead and keep putting those answers in. Let's see what everybody's talking about. True, we've all heard about uh, nitrates. There's a lot of information out there. Um, let's see, there I see one false. Uh, okay, well, let's take a look through, um, let's take a look through what uh, the answer actually is. The answer is false. So nitrates in food are not um, uh, are not necessarily bad for you. And I'm gonna tell you why, because although you see a hot dog in the back right now, I'm gonna tell you that spinach, which I think everyone, including Popeye, would actually say is healthy and probably your mother, um, spinach actually has 23 times more nitrates in a serving of spinach than a serving of hot dogs, 23 times. Now, why is that? Spinach is a plant that grows low to the ground and there's nitrogen it picks up in the soil and it's present in the leaves. Now, I'm gonna tell you what the implications of that are, but I think everyone would agree that spinach is actually a healthy food um, to actually eat. Beets, another food that grows low to the ground, has 15 times the amount of nitrates uh, uh, that, that is found in a hot dog. So if you're surprised by that, think about the fact that nitrogen is actually a critical element in the soil for plants and plant-based foods to grow on. So, you know, a lot of times we hear about uh, harmful things that are associated with foods that aren't good for us, but we just kind of take a black and white view. Here I'm sharing with you that um, although hot dogs do have nitrates, spinach and beets have more, and both of these are healthy foods. Now, <clears throat> I'm not encouraging you to eat a hot dog. Rather, what I'm showing you is that when you actually eat a food with nitrates, here's actually what happens. Um, when you're chewing your food, the nitrates that are found in the food will interact with the uh, normal healthy bacteria that's found on your tongue. It's called the tongue microbiome. And what that bacteria does is it interacts with the nitrogen from the soil and converts it to a form that when you swallow it, it gets absorbed into the bloodstream as nitric oxide, which you're looking at the screen. Now, what this nitric oxide does, it causes our blood vessels to widen. What happens when blood vessels widen? Well, we get better blood flow and our blood pressure actually goes down, which is a healthy thing considering hypertension or high blood pressure is such uh, one of those chronic diseases that we're always trying to treat and that your primary care doctor, your cardiologist, everybody is sort of on your case about trying to lower your blood pressure. And here is an example of nitrogen in food that your tongue, so that's why you wanna chew your food, chew your beets, chew your spinach, that bacteria changes that nitrogen into a form that actually lowers your blood pressure. Now, how do we know this is true, right? This is actually what's important. Food as medicine research involves a laboratory. It can involve laboratory, um, and it can involve cells in a plastic dish or in a test tube. It can involve animal experiments with mice and rats. Uh, uh, it can also involve clinical studies. And this is what I'm actually showing you here. This is actually a study of people that are drinking beet juice, sipping it really, so that the juice has a chance to interact with um, the um, bacteria on the tongue. And you can see if you remove the nitrates from the juice, and it can be done in a laboratory, you can see there's not much change in the blood pressure. But when you actually have beet, sipping on beet juice, that actually has the nitrogen, all right? So this is a controlled experiment. You can kind of see that the beet juice interacting with the, the nitrogen, interacting with the tongue microbiome bacteria, okay, actually causes nitri uh, nitric oxide, you swallow it. And in this experiment, blood pressure was measured and the measurement went down. How long does it go down for? Well, in this experiment, the blood pressure went down for up to four hours or more, okay? So this is a very substantial decrease in uh, blood pressure actually uh, difficult for some people to even take medicines to make the blood pressure go down that quickly and this many points. Okay, here's another question I wanna ask you guys. Here's a statement, soy increases breast cancer risk. Soy increases breast cancer risk, true or false? Let's go ahead and have you guys put your answers in the chat. True or false, soy increases breast cancer risk. What are you actually saying? Let's see, I 
and see what people's answers are. Some people say true, some people say false. Let's, let's have some more answers coming in. All right, let's take a look at the answer. The answer is false. Soy does not increase breast cancer risk. Now, that's a big statement because even the medical community, if you talk to breast cancer surgeons or uh, genetic counselors, or you talk to primary care doctors, many physicians even quote this, that soy increases the risk of breast cancer. Well, it's interesting because if you um, look at Asia, where soy is a basic food, and you go to Japan, you go to Korea, you go to China, you go to Vietnam, and the women there also get breast cancer, if you ask them what if they're advised to stop eating a soy after receiving a breast cancer diagnosis, they are not told. They are not told. Um, the more soy that they eat, the lower the risk of death. So this is actually quite remarkable. So this is these are women who are at the very highest risk of breast cancer uh, in a study called the Shanghai uh, Breast Cancer Study. 5,000 women with breast cancer who are the survivors. They follow them for a number of years. And in this particular study, those women who ate more soy had a 29% reduction in the risk of death and also a 32% reduction that the breast cancer would come back. Now, when they actually calculated by um, a, a report how much soy women were uh, consuming in order to get that 29% risk of death, it was about 10 grams of soy uh, protein a day. So let's take a look at how much 10 grams of soy protein is. Well, these are some conversions. It's about a cup of plain soy milk, a cup of edamame, uh, half a cup of tempeh, half a cup of black soybeans, about a sixth of a cup of roasted soybeans. So these are easily achievable amounts of soy. This is not a recommendation uh, to eat soy, but really a presentation of the research of what we're doing in food as medicine that is really eye-opening because this actually starts to really carve away at all those confusing facts that we always hear. Now, oh, Dr. Lee, uh, could you please share your screen again, please? Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I don't know how I got kicked off. No worries. Yeah, just share that. Yeah, um, great. Let's see. Sorry, did you guys see that last data? Did you see the... Uh, no, slide? we're just seeing it for the first time. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, did you see this slide? Nope. Okay. So what I was saying is that, um, I'll just quickly uh, recap. This study called the Shanghai Women's Breast Cancer Study looked at the women who had the highest risk of breast cancer, and they looked at 5,000 of them, and, and they, care, they recorded how much soy they were actually eating. And it turns out those women who ate more soy, and how much was 10 grams of soy protein a day, actually had a 29% reduction in the risk of death in this study, and 32% reduction in the risk of the cancer coming back. So really eye-opening. And what I was doing was explaining uh, uh, how much 10 grams per day of soy protein is, and it's easily readily achievable amounts of soy protein. So it's really quite amazing uh, that uh, as in food as medicine research, we're able to look in the lab and see that um, uh, what soy actually does, and we're, which I'm going to show you in a moment, but also um, to take a look at uh, what uh, the uh, clinical study is, because at the end of the day, the rubber that meets the road is what actually happens in the clinic. Now, why does why did this why did this urban legend of soy being harmful even come about? Well, we do know that soy uh, beans actually contain a phytoestrogen. Phyto means plant, plant estrogen, and it's called genistein. And there's a few other ones as well. And the real question is: Should you should people be be eating this? Should women be eating this phytoestrogen? Well, what's really interesting is if you compare the phytoestrogen to the human estrogen, phytoestrogen on the left, human estrogen on the right. I don't think that you need to be a chemist to appreciate that they don't look anything alike. They're not the same chemical, all right? In fact, the phytoestrogen, the soy estrogen, blocks the effect of the human estrogen. Some people have actually remarked it to be similar to like a plant-based tamoxifen which we do prescribe for women who actually have breast cancer. So again, it blocks the effects of human estrogen. So how did this rumor come about? Well, like many things in nutrition, a well-intentioned person uh, understood that human, some human breast cancers are responsive to estrogen, can be driven by estrogen. 
And then when they saw that plants have a phytoestrogen, they automatically made that connection. But as I showed you at the very beginning from the human studies, in fact, it's not true. And now I'm showing you the chemical reason why it's not true. In fact, plant estrogens block the effect of human estrogens. Now, of course, a critic would say, well, Dr. Lee, you just showed one study. Uh, uh, and of course, one study needs to be replicated by other studies before I'll believe it. So here is what we call a meta-analysis. And on the left-hand column is a list of 14 clinical trials in humans looking at uh, women with breast cancer and eating soy. And that one, dotted line in the middle basically divides the results of these 14 studies into whether or not eating soy caused more death, which would be on the left, or more survival, which is on the right. And you can see out of 14 studies, in every single case, eating soy leads to more breast cancer survival. And in no case does it re result in more death, okay? Again, this is science, this is clinical studies. This is what we're doing in food as medicine is really cutting through those urban legends, all right? So hopefully I I've left you with something there. Now let's actually ask a really important question, right? Because hopefully I've made you scratch your head a little bit to say, wait a minute, I thought, I thought nitrates in food was bad. And how come that's not true? <clears throat> well, I can tell you that the amount of nitrates uh, or the kind of nitrates and the kind of other preservatives in highly processed meat are not good for you, but the um, plant-based nitrates actually are perfectly fine. Um, we talked about soy. So wait a minute. I You told me that soy is actually not harmful for you. In fact, it might even be good for you uh, based on the clinical research. So this really, I hope, um, opens your mind to ask questions. And although we are gonna talk about diseases this evening, I wanna ask you an even more profound question, okay? And that question is, what is health? So um, let's go ahead and have you uh, 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 go ahead and type in some of your uh, question, your answers in the chat. What do you think health is? You know, I, I used to ask this question myself when I was in medical school, trying to figure out like, all right, what is, what is actual health? Right. So, is it absence of disease? Is it um, uh, vitality? Is it clarity of mind? I mean, the answers are pouring in, and um, and I, and I'm going to actually tell you that although every individual's definition of health for themselves is maybe different and should be different, because we're all unique individuals, and that's one of the important uh, aspects of integrative medicine is really not trying to copy paste or try to put everybody into a single formula, but really trying to include the individualism. But I will tell you as a researcher, so I'm an internal medicine doctor, but I'm a vascular biologist. I study blood vessels. And as a scientist, I'm always trying to figure out, well, how do you define something? Like what does research tell us? Well, health used to be to me, if I'm not sick, I must be healthy. So health is the absence of disease. The reason that that's a, actually kind of a frustrating answer is that we all want better health, but actually trying to achieve something that is the absence of something else, okay? That's like saying that wealth is the absence of poverty. I wanna figure out how to get rich. Well, the absence of poverty doesn't give you any answers. It's not useful, right? So, so I wanna tell you that health is not just the absence of disease. That is one part of it, but health is in fact the result of our own bodies, human bodies, hardwired systems of health defense. So we actually have health defenses that are hardwired in our body. What do we mean by health defense? Well, I wanna show you this picture. Most of you guys have seen a castle, if not actually having gone to Europe uh, or, or you know, uh, you may have been to Disney. Disney's got a nice castle as well. But of course, everyone you know who's grown up with fairy tales have uh, seen pictures of castles. And if you look really closely at a castle, there are lots of different elements of castles that are designed for defense. In fact, almost every aspect of the architecture of a castle is intended for uh, defense. So let me just kind of share with you a few. Look at those slits in the column, uh, the columns. That's Those are arrow slits for people to fire arrows at invaders. The walls of a castle are slightly sloped, which makes it difficult for people to crawl up. And I'll show you, here's the anatomy of what's, what's going on. There's even a bent entrance so people can't rush in very uh, hard. The spiral staircase in a castle, okay, it's interesting. It always goes up clockwise, okay? Why does the stairway goes up clockwise? Think about it. 
if you are uh, if you are a, a a knight in a castle defending it, most people are right-handed. So if you're standing defending it and you've got your sword in your right hand, you can swing downwards on a spiral staircase that goes up clockwise. If you're an enemy and you're right-handed running up the stairs and a clockwise stairs, it's much more difficult to swing up. Okay, so every aspect of a castle is is critically uh, designed uh, to be able to to help uh, defend um, all the citizens within. Well, the body is the same way, and I want to share with you the research I've done to look at what is are the bodies, the body fortress, our 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 body as a castle. What are some of our health defenses? Angiogenesis, how body grows blood vessels. Um, uh, our regeneration, our stem cells that are in our body, our microbiome, our gut health, healthy gut bacteria. We talked a little bit about bacteria in the tongue, healthy bacteria. There's a lot more lower in the gut. Our DNA, not just a uh, uh, not just our genetic code, but actually our DNA is hardwired to protect us from the environment, from uh, ultraviolet radiation from the sun, from radon from the basement, uh, from off-gassing from our carpet and our furniture and the new car smell, and even from the fumes that we would breathe in when we're pumping gas at the filling station. If you can smell those fumes, you're standing downwind of the gas, and all those chemicals that we're breathing in are actually damaging our DNA. But fortunately, our body can fix itself as part of the health defense. And of course, our immune immunity. Like our grandmas always told us that how important it is to have a good immune system. And certainly after the last two and a half years, we are very, very alert to how important good immunity is. So I'm gonna talk about um, health defenses and talk about what they mean for uh, diseases. But these actually are really amazing because food, the food that we eat can activate our health defenses. And that's what I'm gonna show with you. Now I came uh, and worked on these health defenses and organize these five health defenses in a very honest way. My background is in biotechnology. I set out 25 years ago to help develop better treatments for cancer, better treatments for heart disease, ways to stop vision loss and blindness, ways to heal people who have diabetes. And what we did uh, when I worked with biotech companies, okay, is to look at these defenses, angiogenesis. How do we develop a better angiogenesis drug? Uh, DNA modification, how do we develop gene therapy, regeneration, how do we develop stem cell therapy, okay, immunity, how do we develop immunotherapy. So each of these health defenses that I just told you foods can activate are the focus of a number of drug company pharmaceutical efforts to develop billion dollar blockbuster drugs that take a decade and oftentimes don't really work that well and, often, and many times uh, are not available fairly to every patient. And so as I was going through my own work, uh, over the decades, I realized that although I have to tell you I've been successful, there I, I, I've been involved with the development of 43 FDA-approved drugs for one or more of these types of systems. So we have new cancer treatments, we have diabetes, we have vision loss treatments. I'm still working on other ones uh, for heart disease, but I will tell you I started to realize that using pharmaceuticals, which are can be life-saving, is really treating the horse out of the barn. So I asked. If we can we do prevention to prevent the disease in the first place? Because who wants a chronic disease? If we can prevent a chronic disease, could we instead have chronic health? That's what I want for my patients, and that's what I want for myself. When you're talking about prevention, you can't really think about drugs. You got to think about things that are safe, available, inexpensive, like food. So here was the unfair advantage I had. Since I worked on these health defenses from a drug development perspective, I had all the tools to be able to throw foods into these same sy test systems to be able to interpret the results and to see what foods do. And what was really amazing is that when you put them up head to head, in many cases, foods can actually beat medicines or at least are equivalent to medicines. And in many cases, foods can combine with medicines to bring you even more benefits. So that's what we're gonna um, uh, talk about. Now, I, I wanna ask you about uh, what, do you, what are the chronic diseases of greatest interest to you guys? What are you interested in? Go ahead and put into the chat, what are some of the diseases that interest you? Go ahead and put, put your own, go ahead and put your own interest in. What are the diseases that you came to hear about that you'd like to know more about when it comes to food? Cancer, I'm hearing, I'm seeing, um, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, long COVID, um, asthma, autoimmune disease, Parkinson's. Look, I mean, what what's flashing through like crazy, like lightning uh, uh, in this uh, is exactly 
the things that concern me as well. Concern me as a as a family member. I've got family members who are afflicted by the diseases that you're entering here. Um, it, I'm also concerned about as a doctor. I take care of patients with cancer and heart disease and diabetes and uh, all those kind of conditions. All chronic diseases actually are crushing our healthcare system. Man, I would like to be able to get to a point where the main work that we do, the heavy lifting is really helping people um, prevent the disease in the first place and to empower everyone to take charge of their own health. Why do you need to go to the doctor's office to be able to get the solution? If food as medicine might be able to help you take command and empower you to actually be in charge of your own health. So that's what we're going to talk about. Before we dive into some of the diseases, I want to share with you um, some information from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. And these are, as of last year, the um, 10 leading causes of death, all right? Um, and not surprisingly, heart disease uh, is out there. Cancer is still out there. COVID kind of goes up and down, uh, hopefully going down now. And diabetes, you know, although it isn't a leading cause of death, it definitely is a leading cause, not a top, like top five. It definitely is a leading cause of morbidity as well as mortality. People with diabetes, their quality of life is severely compromised. They have, they have vision problems. They have nerve problems. They have wound problems heart problems, kidney problems. Anybody who's listening who um, knows somebody with diabetes understands how important it is to prevent uh, and reverse some of those uh, some of those shortcomings that that people that people with diabetes are struggling with. And I, I think it's really important to, to say these are people with diabetes. I don't refer to them as diabetic patients, all right? Uh, patients are having diabetes and other diseases as well. So these, uh, I put in the orange box, I wanna share with you some of the work I've done looking at uh, how foods can actually activate your health defenses to combat some of these uh, diseases. Let's start with the biggie, the C word, cancer, all right? Everyone has been touched by cancer at some level in their family. This is like the, you know, that Kevin Bacon uh, game, six degrees of separation. I would say when it comes to cancer, there's almost no degrees of separation or one degree of separation at most. But most of us know somebody directly that actually has been touched by cancer. It's a word that actually generates fear, even among doctors, okay? And, and we are not immune in the medical community from uh, cancer uh, either. But I wanna share with you some important insights on that, what we have discovered about cancer recently. And that is, and, and that, is that one thing that cancer needs to grow to become dangerous is angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is how the body grows blood vessels. Um, uh, angio, blood, blood vessel, blood vessel, uh, vessel, genesis is growth. One of our body's health defenses is actually to make sure it can grow enough blood vessels in the body and then stop. Prevent diseases like cancer from getting extra blood vessels to selfishly feed themselves. What do I mean by it? Let me show you a picture, all right? Cancer is hijack angiogenesis. So take a look at the far left, uh, upper corner, there's this little gray hole, dot. That little uh, tiny little ditzel is actually a microscopic cancer. Why do they form? Well, the human body is made out of 40 trillion cells that have to replicate. They have to copy themselves. And by the way, that's why we're here today. And that's why we're still going to be here tomorrow because our body is repeating itself, copy and pasting itself. Now, if I asked you to copy and paste something 10 times, you're probably going to do it perfectly. If I asked you to copy and paste something a hundred times, you'll probably do it okay, but you might make a state mistake or two. Now, we're asking the body, the human body, to copy and paste, replicate cells 40 trillion times, almost all in a day, okay? You can imagine how many mistakes get made. I'm gonna give you the answer. About 10,000 mistakes are made every 24 hours that lead to these tiny little microscopic mutation, mutated cells that are tiny cancers. So in fact, Children form cancer, adult form cancers, healthy people, athletes, everyone's got cancer in their body. It's like a pimple. And because you can't see it, it's microscopic. It can't get any bigger than two to three millimeters in diameter without a blood supply because no oxygen, no food, no nutrition. The cancer just stays there like a pimple. Now think about it. If you saw a pimple on your face in the mirror in the morning, you might stare at it and want to get rid of it. But if that pimple grew in your back, and you couldn't see it, you wouldn't even know when it goes away. And that's really what we're beginning to understand about the biology of how cancer develops and how our body's um, uh, defense systems ward off its ability to grow. So the question isn't, why did I get cancer? When, you know, that, that's a very common question that cancer patients ask. Really, the question I want you to ask um, is to think about is, 
why don't we get cancer more often, right? So you're at a bus stop, you smell somebody else's cigarette smoke. How come you don't get lung cancer? You're breathing the fumes. If you're standing downwind when you're pumping gas, how come you don't get lung cancer? Well, there's a, because your body's health defenses are preventing those cancers that might form microscopically from ever getting to be dangerous. And then your immune system wings by like cops on a beat patrolling a safe neighborhood and sees something abnormal, like a drug dealer sitting in the corner, might not be doing anything bad, but it, but like a policeman would put the, the bad guy into the paddy wagon, um, the immune cells will gobble up the microscopic cancer and dispose of them. That's how we realize um, how cancers form and disappear in our body all the time. The scary cancers are the ones that actually get a blood supply. Over months or years, a few will actually figure out how to trick our body Okay, our defenses are down and um, and they're able to recruit selfishly a private blood supply. And once cancers get a blood supply, they can explode in growth. In the lab that I was working in, um, we found that uh, if you um, isolated a tumor from a, a, a blood supply, it would stay small forever, essentially. But once you let the tumor touch blood vessels, a, a tiny little small cancer can grow 16,000 times in size in just two weeks. So angiogenesis is a big trigger. All right, what's interesting is that you can actually cut off the blood supply to cancer. This is part of the drug development work that I've done in the past. And there are now more than a dozen anti-angiogenic drugs that starve cancers by cutting off the blood supply. More than a dozen pharmaceuticals, but guess what? There are foods that can actually do this as well. Remember I told you I went from developing drugs to saying, could we throw some foods into the systems and see if we get a similar effect? And this is in a lab. So let me just give you an example of one food that can actually do that. Tomato actually contains a natural molecule called lycopene, okay? It's a carotenoid. Uh, it's what makes actually tomatoes red. And uh, uh, lycopene, when you actually pick a tomato off a vine and, and chew it and bite it, like and eat it like an apple or cut it into a salad, most of the lycopene is in a form that doesn't get really absorbed that well. You'll absorb 20% of it, 80% of it just go, goes out the chute below, okay? But if you actually cook it, the tomato, the heat from cooking simmering tomatoes like tomato sauce will change that chemical structure into a form your body loves to absorb, like 85% absorption, which is exactly what we want for lycopene. Now I took lycopene and I went to the lab and we tested in a system to see if it would stop those blood vessels from growing towards a tumor in the lab. And indeed, that's exactly what we found. Lycopene was a potent anti-angiogenic cancer starving molecule, okay? And really quite amazing. Um, uh, and in fact, there are research publishing publications on this. So I'm not the only person that's done it. I, I did the work back in 2010, two years later, other people replicated it. So this is a repeat um, uh, of the work that we had done. Very important, the British Journal of Nutrition, highly credible journal. Now, remember I told you rubber meets the road is actually what happens with people. And here we are, the health professionals follow-up study. It's a massive study, more than 40,000 men studied over 20 years. And they looked at nutrition and cancer outcomes. And what did they find? They found that those men who ate two to three servings of cooked tomatoes, that's tomato sauce per week. Now, how, mu how much was a serving? Half a cup of cooked tomatoes. Okay, now think about it, tomato sauce. If I gave you only half a cup of tomato sauce for your pasta, you'd probably come back and ask me for a little bit more. All right, so not much. Again, readily attainable amounts of food. Eating tomatoes, tomato sauce with lycopene in a form you could absorb was associated in more than 40,000 men with a reduced risk in this study of developing prostate cancer by 30% by cutting off the blood supply to prevent cancers from actually growing up. And in fact, they looked at the people who did develop prostate cancer because look, 30% didn't get it, 70% did. They biopsy the prostate and they took a look and here's what they found that those men who did develop prostate cancer, when you biopsy their prostate and you compare uh, uh, how aggressive the cancer was, how many blood vessels are feeding the cancer, those uh, uh, men who had more tomato sauce um, per week over the course of the month actually had fewer blood vessels, all right? This is anti-androgenic seen in pathology in a research study that really makes a very strong case and that's really why this was published in the Journal of the National Cancer Research, in the Journal of the National Cancer Research Institute, um, that 
um, that foods, the foods that we eat actually can have a meaningful correlation with uh, diseases that we care about. So for men, prostate cancer. Now there's a, there's a similar study for women in breast cancer and the reduction was almost about 40% in a clinical uh, study looking at association. Now, remember I just told you uh, about uh, cooking the tomatoes. This has been studied too. How long do you have to um, change a tomato to so that's how it's available? Well, you know, you actually uh, get better bioavailability um, by simmering at 190 degrees. That's simmering, not boiling. 212 is boiling. And two minutes, you've actually converted about half of what you want to do. At three minutes, you've really transformed a lot. You get a lot more bioavailability. You've really kind of supercharged it. Now, we've actually studied this in the human body as well. If you cook tomatoes in water, right? That, I don't know who cooks tomatoes in water. I cook my tomatoes in olive oil by making a sauce. But then you would actually take a look um, uh, at the uh, you'll, it'll, the temperature will go up. Lycopene will be changed. It will be absorbed into bloodstream. But then you compare how much is, is of lycopene is in the blood from tomato sauce cooked in water compared to olive oil. The oil actually has a lot more. Now, why is that? About three times, three times more. It's because lycopene is what we call a fat soluble molecule. Lycopene um, is kind of like soap. It doesn't dissolve very well in regular water, but it'll dissolve in soapy water. And when I say fat soluble, I mean, it doesn't like to dissolve that easy, readily in regular water, but it'll dissolve in oil really easily. So tomatoes and olive oil simmered over a period of time. What is, what is that? Mediterranean cuisine, all right? So Nona was right. When she said, eat, you know, have my pasta with my tomato sauce, um, it's actually cooked in a healthy way. So this is, again, food is medicine. We can actually study it, um, not just looking at the food to say, here's my superfood. We're actually able to study the food, ask what's in it, look at the human, look at that and, and see how do we study that and look at the correlations. This is really what food is medicine is. I'm actually one of the people that not only um, uh, talks about food and health, but actually does the kind of study as well. By the way, what kind of olive oils um, do you want to use? Because olive oils, olives contain healthy anti-angiogenic cancer-starving polyphenols. One of them is called um, hydroxytyrosol. So how many olive oils are out there? Well, there's a lot of different olive oils. Which one would you want to pick? One of olive oils from one of these three olives. So, so olive oil monovarietal. So when I go to the store, I actually go to the middle aisles, right? And I look for olive oil. What do you, most people do? Just grab the one that they are familiar with. Here's what I do. I pick up each of the uh, bottles and I look at the side and I look for mono varietal to see if there's any, um, uh, it tells you what type of olive the olive oil is pressed from. And these three, Mariolo from Italy, Coronecchi from Greece, and Picuel from Spain, the Coronecchi and, and Picuel, Greek and Spanish olive, olives are quite common. So you can find those in almost any uh, uh, food store you'd go to these days. Um, that's the kind that I used to simmer with my tomatoes because I want extra polyphenols actually from the olive uh, oil as well. So again, um, think about how we know the Mediterranean cuisine is actually healthy. Now we're getting down to the science of it as well. Oh, what about the tomatoes? Is there a tomato that's got higher amounts of lycopene? Absolutely. San Marzano tomatoes, uh, cherry tomatoes have a lot of lycopene. Those black tomatoes that only appeared on the market in the last few years, a lot of lycopene. And, and ironically, Tangerine tomatoes aren't red. They don't look like they'd have a lot of red lycopene dye, but they already have the lycopene in a form where it's chemically transformed. You don't need to cook those. You eat, eat those like an apple, you'll get a lot of lycopene absorbed. It's already got the, the chemical form of lycopene your body can readily absorb. So if you want to make a salad make, and you want to get that lycopene, make it with a tangerine tomato, which is this kind of yellowish tomato. So again, you know, a lot of people talk about food and health in kind of like a textbooky sort of way, preachy sort of way. I love to talk about it in a way that we can all relate to because we're going to the store, summertime's coming up, we're going to see a ton of tomatoes. Which one are you going to pick? Hopefully you'll think about this um, uh, presentation. Now, a lot of foods with anti-angiogenic activity, please um, come to my website, uh, sign up for a download. I'm going to have a gift for you at the very end um, or buy my book. There's tables and charts. These are all the foods that we have studied with anti-angiogenic cancer-starving activity. Um, and you can look at it on the replay to take the notes. Let's talk about heart disease, number one killer of men and women. What happens in heart disease? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of heart disease, but the ones that I want to call your attention to are the ones that are quite common and, you know, and that affect a lot of people. It's blockages of blood vessels 
that impair blood flow. So you don't get good blood flow that leads to heart attack when the, uh, when the vessels are narrowed or can lead to stroke or it can lead to peripheral arterial disease. This is something where, you know, you don't get good blood flow to your legs, really hard to walk, you know, take a walk in the park or walk in the mall or walk to the store. You, you'll get a cramp because you don't have enough blood flow. You got to sit down and rest. Peripheral arterial disease, when it gets bad enough, you know, your, your skin will break down, you'll get a wound, an arterial ulcer that can get infected. And it's a common cause of amputation in people with vascular disease. Worse, if, you, uh, if you're a smoker because of the vasoconstriction, your blood vessels are clamped down. All right, so what could we actually do to grow blood vessels? I just told you about cancer, cut off the blood supply. Why don't we grow blood vessels? Well, guess what? There's research on foods that can grow blood vessels too. Now, um, uh, by the way, I want to. I'm going to come back to this for a second, but I'm going to remind myself now to tell you why one side is not going to screw up the other side. Barley has something called beta deglucan in it. It's a natural chemical. You can make pasta out of it, actually, barley pasta, and it's been studied in the lab. And guess what? When you feed animals that have um, uh, blockages in their heart, um, pasta made with barley that has beta deglucan, beta deglucan stimulates angiogenesis helps the body grow blood vessels, not to tumors, only to where it needs it in the heart, for example. And this has been shown, and you look into the research study, I'm not gonna have to take the time to walk through the study with you. Just look at the bar, the, the bar charts. Um, and you can kind of see in the orange circle that black is where the uh, uh, mice uh, who actually had, were suffering from poor blood flow in the heart, when they ate the pasta made with beta-glucan, their uh, blood vessels actually got more dense, they grew more blood vessels, uh, and actually they got better blood flow as well. So again, food growing blood vessels. Let me show you another one. A fruit peel, an apple peel, could be a peel of an apricot or a pear, contains a natural molecule called ursolic acid. Now what does ursolic acid do? Ursolic acid actually helps the body produce exactly what I showed you spinach and beets did at the very beginning. It produces nitric oxide, nitrogen, Okay, and when it produces nitric oxide or solic acid, what did I tell you it does? It lowers blood pressure by dilating, widening the blood vessels. In this case, nitric oxide does something more. It stimulates stem cells that are in our bone marrow and our stem cells are left over from the time we were in our mom's womb. So when our chin and our ears and our liver and our face was all developing, um, it was all developed with stem cells starting at day five all the way to nine months. When we were born, we had extra stem cells. And it's kind of like when you finish painting a room, you buy an extra can of paint so you don't want to run out. But when we were born, we had extra stem cells, didn't want to run out our bodies. So we had extra stem cells. Those stem cells, when we were born, got, it's kind of like a you know can of paint. You put the cap on, you put it in the garage. Well, the stem cells that are overages, extras at the very end before we we're born, get packed up and put into our bone marrow. Or solic acid and nitric oxide call out those stem cells when we need to repair our cells and regenerate from the inside out. And in fact, we've studied this in the lab. Uh, this is actually what we call an ischemic limb. Remember I told you peripheral arterial disease, no blood flow in the, in the leg. And here is an animal that's been fed uh, fruit peel. And you can kind of see three weeks later, we've grown back the blood supply, all right? Foods as medicine in this experiment's case, showing you that you can stimulate the revascularization, no bypass, no stent, and this is not a human, this isn't a lab animal, uh, and, and ursolic acid has also been studied in humans and will do something very similar uh, as well. And these are stem cells that are doing. So these are um, uh, angiogenesis stimulating foods. Um, and I wanted to tell you, so if you give a cancer uh, starver, like a, a anti-angiogenic food, like a tomato, um, we, are you going to cut off the blood supply to your leg? Nope. Your heart? Nope. Because your body's health defenses can block the effect of foods only to a certain point. So it's kind of like a, a lawn. If you're a landscaper, you're responsible for a lawn. You need the perfect layer of grass. If it's too high, you'll mow it down. That's anti-angiogenic, cancer-starving food. But if you have a bald patch where you need more blood vessels and you need to put grass seed on to grow the blood vessels up, um, that's exactly what these angiogenesis stimulating foods do. And if they grow too tall, guess what? Your body will mow down the overage so you won't actually get into trouble. So that's how food, like medicines that I've helped to develop, we can punch through the body's defenses because medicines are, they're the blunt instrument. They're like the, they're, they're taking the cannon out. Foods are kinder, gentler ways to help our body's health defenses work. Let's talk about diabetes. 
Now, diabetes is not one disease, actually, although we code it that way as doctors. I'll tell you, diabetes is a lot of different diseases with a lot of different problems. We try to put an umbrella name on it, but I wanna share with you one thing that we do know about diabetes, okay? So we're not gonna have time to go through every problem that diabetic uh, patients have, but let me share with you that in diabetes, um, you know, the heart is affected, the kidneys affected, the eyesight's affected, the brain can be affected, nerves are affected. Well, it turns out that um, one of our health defenses, which is our stem cells, that remember those that overage that gets packed away when we're born, our stem cells are naturally, normally regenerating us from the inside out. Again, silently, we're sleeping and our stem cells are, you know what, let's replace that part of the liver that doesn't look so good. It's kind of like, you know, the stem cells are like the, 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 the people that are continuously manicuring uh, your, 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 your garden uh, and your lawn and your property. Uh, you know, you don't even have to worry about it. They're, they're taking a look to say, you know, let's go ahead and put a, another one there. And, and so uh, we can, and it helps us regenerate. Our livers can regenerate. Our tip of our lung can regenerate. Our nerves can regenerate. Okay. Uh, and we're beginning to realize that parts of our heart can regenerate and even our brain can regenerate just only too slowly. Now, what happens, and that's normal, healthy people uh, who do not have diabetes. What happens in diabetes? Well, we know that uh, number one, as we age, we start losing some of the potency of our stem cells. So our stem cells just get a little duller as we get time. Think about their flashlight with a battery, okay? Got the battery a long time, you've used the flashlight a long time, it's a little dimmer. You go, 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 go outside with a walk on your street at night after, after dark, and the bulb isn't quite as bright. And that's what happens as we age. So it's for that reason, a lot of people are, and these are some of the diseases that stem cells seem to be impaired, Alzheimer's, macular degeneration, osteoporosis, a lot of different ones, including erectile dysfunction. Well, and, and that's the reason why from the biotech perspective, so many people are trying to develop stem cell therapy. Now I'm not talking about, I've, I've been involved with this. I'm just telling you, this is not the corner strip mall where you get your knee or your uh, elbow injected or your shoulder injected. I'm telling you as somebody who's done, been involved with stem cell therapy, it's not ready for prime time. Uh, we know it works. It just, we haven't figured out how to make it work well enough for the FDA to approve it. So it might, it's going to take some more years to work on it, but guess what? Food and, and foods can actually work on it. So diabetes, we also know now you take aging and you put diabetes on top of that. We know in uh, patients with diabetes, in this case, uh, comparing 40 patients, 20 of them had no diabetes, 20 of them had type one diabetes, and you just measure their stem cells in their blood. This is actually a research uh, uh, project that was actually done at Vanderbilt University, and you just measure it, and you can see that diabetes actually leads to a um, uh, 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 decrease in stem cells. Now, foods can reverse that uh, defect, and what are some of the foods? Well, omega-3 fatty acids, which you can get from oily fish, all right? Um, salmon, sardines, uh, anchovies, but actually even shellfish contain omega-3 fatty acids, um, can actually restore the defective stem cells that are found in diabetes, okay? It's really quite amazing that uh, something you can eat can actually kind of turn back the clock and give stem cells more energy. And again, you know, these are, uh, this is not about treatment. This is really observing what actually happens. In diabetes, you get stunning of the stem cells. Diet, you can actually reverse the function of the stem cells. This is food as medicine research, all right? Not a recommendation. I'm sharing with you as a scientist and as a doctor working in this field, what we're actually seeing. And, and yet, you know, we do know that eating seafood is a, one of the healthy uh, uh, proteins, um, uh, sources of protein uh, that you can have. What about plant-based? Well, here's one. This is actually a cacao pod. This is dark chocolate is made, chocolate cacao is made from this. It's a, um, a plant-based food. I'm not talking about the candy bar. That's a confection. It's got added sugar, it's got fats, unhealthy fats. It's got all kinds of chemical preservatives. I'm talking about 85% dark chocolate, it's bittersweet, mostly bitter, okay? Um, what's really interesting is that clinical studies have been done looking at um, uh, people with coronary artery disease. These are men in their 60s who have coronary artery disease. They have heart disease already, and some of them have diabetes as well. And at the very beginning, you measure how many stem cells in their bloodstream. Remember, the stem cells can help uh, um, uh, regenerate uh, the blood flow, the, the endothelium, the lining of the blood vessels. 
So you give them two cups of hot cocoa a day to drink, and the hot cocoa is made with high flavanol cacao, so dark chocolate, 85% or higher, twice a day, and a month later, you measure their stem cells all over again, and guess what? You can have up to a twofold increase in the number of stem cells that are in the bloodstream. Now you actually measure blood flow. When they use an ultrasound to measure the blood flow in their arms, they also found that they had up to two times the improvement in blood flow as well. Food is medicine research with foods that most people, you know, most people don't uh, hate chocolate. And this is really interesting. But again, it's dark chocolate and it's the polyphenols uh, that are in it. So there's lots of foods that can stimulate stem cells. And again, uh, I have lists and tables in my book uh, 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 as well. And if you come to my website at Dr. William Lee, Dr. William Lee, L -I .com, you can sign up for my newsletter. I'm putting out new information all the time for free really talking about foods, more foods that are being discovered every week that actually inf influence and impact uh, on uh, these health defenses, including our stem cells. I want you to notice on the right-hand column at the second to the last, squid ink, black pasta also protects stem cells, which is pretty cool because if you've ever had black rice in Spain or uh, um, black pasta in Italy, it's pretty tasty. Um, uh, the squid uses that ink in order to escape from predators and it's edible, it's got its really briny taste um, and it actually protects stem cells as well. So again, I, I think it's really amazing when we're actually discovering all the things that foods can actually do. Now, there are patterns that enhance stem cells uh, that of how we eat and patterns that can harm stem cells. And I think what's really important is that the things that harm stem cells are the things that we already know, too much fat, unhealthy fats, too much salt, hyperglycemia, too much sugar. So one reason to stay young and to really stay, allow your body's defenses to help regenerate your health, continuously maintain and regenerate your health is to eat healthy patterns of food that you can see on that left-hand side. Now, diabetes also impairs immunity. Remember I told you that you wanna boost your immunity. So this is a really interesting study um, that was done looking at people getting flu vaccine and whether or not um, uh, having broccoli sprouts that contain uh, isothiocyanates, these are sulforaphane, same as in the adult broccoli, but more concentrated. If they had the flu vaccine and broccoli sprouts, what would happen? And so this is a study from University of North Carolina uh, in, in, in Switzerland at Basel and, and Stanford, took 29 healthy volunteers, everybody got a flu vaccine. Half of them actually got two cups of broccoli sprout shake. All right, it's a shake that they had in the morning and they measured it for four days. And guess what they found when they looked in their blood? The sprout eaters, natural killer cells, these are cells that actually pump up for immunity had 22 times more potency, more activity. And the natural killer cells had more killing power for against viruses. And when they did the swab, in this case, not for COVID, for the flu, they also had fewer virus particles in our nose because the body was armed. This isn't food versus medicine. This is food and medicine, tool in a toolbox. That's what food is medicine research is contributing to. This is why doctors need to know about this and think about this and keep up with the research um, because it actually is helpful. Now, if you don't like actually broccoli sprouts or you can't find broccoli sprouts, a grown-up broccoli has the same thing. Let's say you don't like to eat the, the trees or the stem. Um, guess what? I tell people, go ahead and make a broccoli soup, a broccoli stem soup. Um, I've made one with a little oregano powder, um, really amazing flavor. Uh, so the key is always to find a way to make foods that are good for you taste great. Now, I'm just going to close by talking about long COVID because I saw some people uh, saying that they were interested in it. So from the, at the very beginning of, of, of the pandemic, there were some people that actually said that um, uh, th there, were some, there were some folks that actually um, uh, wound up being at risk for COVID because they were in uh, Wuhan, China, for example. And uh, they wanted to find out like who was going to go on to develop COVID and who wasn't going to get COVID because not everybody got COVID. And what they did is they collected the poop from people in, the, in a big group that they looked at, okay, 1,700 participants, and then they actually asked them what they ate, and then they measured their blood to see what kind of cytokines, virus-killing cytokines like interferon gamma. They wanted to find out um, uh, who were the people that wound up getting COVID versus not getting COVID, and then they would have the blood to look at this viral findings, virus-fighting cytokines, then they look in the poop to see what kind of bacterial organisms, microbiome, the people who were vulnerable or the people who were resistant had. Then they had the food questionnaire so they knew what they were eating. So let me tell you what was really amazing because this is a complicated study and I don't want to show you the metagenomics. I just want to give you kind of like the top line. Guess what? 
they found that there were two bacteria that were in the, in the poop in people that actually were resistant. And they those people had more interferon gamma. That's a natural uh, uh, viral virus fighter that our, our own immune system produces. And they found that the people who had more interferon gamma also had more lactobacillus in their poop, natural healthy gut bacteria. And the people who had more lactobacillus were the people that were drinking tea, both green tea and black tea. What do they have? The tea has catechins, EGCG, okay? Uh, these tea catechins, uh, they were drinking more green or black tea. They had more lactobacillus, they had more interferon gamma, and they had less COVID. This was at the very beginning of the pandemic. And I want to say July, we started to make these discoveries. So uh, I'm not going to give you any like recommendations. I'm just telling, sharing with you information that we've discovered um, that really is, is mind-blowingly uh, important because you know, at the at, in the middle of the pandemic, when everybody was locked in, we had no vaccines, we had no antivirals. The doctors didn't want to see you, uh, and the hospitals had nothing to offer other than a ventilator. You know, and then throwing the kitchen sink, and we lost a lot of people that way. And everybody had to eat. And so, and so, one of the questions I asked during the, all throughout the pandemic is, what should we be eating? What are the things that can help in, improve our immune system? Interfering gamma, a virus killer. Now, the other thing that was discovered is that. Um, uh, there's another bacteria that where people also had a lot of interferon gamma called ruminococcus. Now, ruminococcus is, is grown by dietary fiber. And so they looked at what were the people eating? Dietary fiber, plant-based foods, uh, uh, including nuts, tree nuts, walnuts, pecans, pistachios, macadamias. They all have dietary fiber. People who had more interferon gamma had more ruminococcus. People who had the ruminococcus were eating more dietary fiber or omega-3 fatty acids. So again, this is kind of the food as medicine research. Now I'm going to do a deep dive because these are association studies. Turns out once you dive deeper, and again, this is a parallel world, like some people are developing vaccines, some people are developing antivirals like Paxlovid. Now other people are actually studying the impact of food. Turns out that kombu, which you find in Japanese food, which is made from seaweed, kelp, a kind of kelp, that you find in your bowl of miso soup at the Japanese restaurant, that black square that's floating around that you can kind of down in one gulp, that is kombu. Inside there is a sulfated polysaccharide. It's kind of a mother nature's kind of sugar molecule that actually interferes with the binding of the coronavirus to human cells. Pretty amazing, right? So food is medicine research. And in fact, they studied this and I don't have time to go through all the details, but kombu extract with the sulfated polysaccharides actually showed that they could interfere with the binding site of the coronavirus to human cells. And when you compare the graph, look at the graph on the left with the pink line and the blue lines, uh, just look at the graph. I'm not gonna explain all the details to you. It looks very similar to the graph of remdesivir, which is an FDA authorized antiviral that was used in the ICU at the beginning. So again, food is medicine. Can we use the same systems to study medicine, to study food? This is the future of what we're looking at in putting more tools in the toolbox of doctors, which includes foods, which is what patients are always asking about. Now, I worked on um, looking at what was going on with, with the circulation in COVID, and it turns out that with COVID, both acute COVID and long COVID, the virus, the coronavirus damages your blood vessels, and you got to fix those blood vessels. So on the left is um, uh, uh, the lung of, of a normal person, and on the right is somebody who has had acute COVID. All right, they're in the hospital and you can see the small blood vessels are disappearing, okay? It, it, it really smokes, it reduces the number of small blood vessels in the body. Now let's take a look at um, long COVID, which is a, a, a strange uh, 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 condition of people weeks later, months later, sometimes for years later, still have difficulty and they can't breathe. They go to the doctor, the doctor says, ah, there's nothing wrong with you. Let's get a chest CT scan, looks normal. So I'm actually doing research now to take those normal chest CTs and do a uh, artificial intelligence calculation so we can visualize the blood vessels. I wanna show you this. Left is normal, right is acute COVID, middle is long COVID. Squint and you'll see that long COVID looks better than the ICU COVID, but it's not normal. So these people, if you have long COVID, you have an explanation. Your blood vessels may be damaged. And this is the kind of research that's going on. Now, why is that important? Uh, because we can calculate, by the way, how much that middle, um, uh, uh, that middle individual, you can see that the small, middle, and large blood vessels, just look at the, um, uh, that, just look at the top, these are the tiniest one, the little red ones. 
only 48% of normal blood vessels. So half of the blood vessels are gone, actually, in this patient. Chest CT scan looks normal. Got to grow them back. How do you do that? Can we use angiogenesis? Can we use stem cells? Can we use nitric oxide? Could we use food? One of the things that I'm work researching now is actually using Viagra, sildenafil, that brings that nitric oxide to actually help to grow back more blood vessels and stimulate stem cells. So there's a lot of work going on in that kind of direction for long COVID. So in long COVID, you've got problems with blood vessels. You need to have rege better regeneration. And the immune system also seems to be acting up, overacting, causing autoimmunity and causing lots of inflammation. So in long COVID, we can take a look at the body's health defenses and say, is there a way that we can actually fix this? Using medicines, existing or to be invented, and very importantly, using foods, right? So this is another way you can try to think about your body and, and what ails it in ways of actually trying to right size your body's health defenses. So here's your action plan, okay? After I get, told you a lot of stuff, I wanna give you something to take home. And um, the, the first thing I want you to think about is that let food be thy medicine is a statement that was attributed to Hippocrates 2000 some years ago. So this idea, although I showed you the science, the idea has been around for a long, long time. So here's what I want you to do at home to make food your medicine. This is like my take home message for you. And in my next slide, I'm gonna actually, I left you a gift um, that I prepared for you guys. So three things, three very simple things. Number one, to make food your medicine, I want you to start with healthy food. I gave you a partial list, you saw it, you can watch this again on a replay. Um, you can see it in my book. I'm gonna give you a whole list about in a second. Um, Choose healthy foods that you already love. Take a Sharpie, circle the ones that you go, man, I like to eat that one and eat more of it. Because if you start eating the healthy food that you already love, that is healthy, you're already way ahead of the game. Number two, cut down or cut out foods that are harmful for your health. We didn't spend much time doing that because so many people actually talk about harmful food. So I didn't want to take up your valuable time this evening by telling you what you've heard from everyone else. Too much sugar, too much soda, alcohol, uh, too much red meat, uh, ultra processed foods, processed meats, you know what they are, cut them, cut them down or cut them out. And then the final thing is to eat with moderation. All right, when we overwhelm our metabolism by eating too much, think Thanksgiving dinner, the second you go to. First plate, great, to go back for second, you heap up the plate again, only two or three forkfuls later, man, you really regret what you did. You're listen to your body. Um, uh, you know, your, your body, uh, I can't actually handle that. So there's a saying called harahachi banmi, stop eating when you're 80% full. That's a good rule of thumb. Eat slowly, listen to your body. When you think you're going to be about full, eat more slowly then stop. These are three simple ways to make food your medicine. Now, I want you to, um, uh, anybody watching this, please just take your cell phone, go to the camera. And this is a QR code. I've created a guide for you that actually contains lists of foods, some recipes, uh, and some facts that will allow you to actually um, download uh, for free uh, a, a, a guide that will build on everything you heard tonight that gives you more food and food lists and give you some more practical tips that I didn't have time to talk to you about. Um, this is also going to be in a replay. You're going to get an email with this as well. But if you, it's simple. I wanted to make it as simple as possible. Anybody watching this, put your camera to it, click on it, and you'll be able to get it as a download. Okay. Um, so next time you go to the doctor, next time if you're our physician or a healthcare professional and you're actually seeing your patient and like, you know, we're so busy trying to handle all the medical things or your integrative practice and you're trying to think through how do I actually bring the right focus to uh, my patients? Think about the kind of science and the kind of research that I've just talked about. And I'll close with this quote from the Nobel laureate Albertson Georgi, who once said, Discovery, real discovery consists of seeing what everybody's seen and thinking what nobody has thought. And what I ho hope I've shown you this evening are some of the foods that we all recognize, that we all, some of us would just really love to eat those foods. And I hope that I've actually stimulated you to think about the same foods in a new way. And that new way tells us about food as medicine. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for that impressive presentation. So more than 3,000 people have joined us tonight. And before we get into the Q&A, there's a lot of interesting questions coming in, uh, just a couple of announcements. If you have found this lecture beneficial, we invite you to subscribe to our monthly e-newsletter. 
Inside Healing, where each month you'll receive wellness tips and videos, updates on upcoming events, and information about Sutter IHH care centers. So please use the QR code or link in the chat box to subscribe. You can also follow us on social media to stay updated. And your health education doesn't have to stop today. If you would like to work more in depth with the tools that Dr. Lee shared, consider signing up for Sharon Meyer's virtual class starting in June. Sharon is our uh, integrative nutritionist and she has a four week class. It's $65 per class, which will help you to explore nutritional tools to enhance disease prevention, cope with a cancer diagnosis or support someone going through treatment. And in this interactive uh, group, you will learn the hidden power of foods and their impact on your health. So to sign up, scan the QR code or click the link in the chat, or you can give us a call at 707-523-7185. So now we're gonna go ahead to the Q&A session. Uh, continue submitting your questions by um, clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom. So um, Dr. Lee, a lot of questions about many of these great foods you talked about. So first question was, um, are there studies comparing the health effects of